really want to do address today the fear consciousness that seems to be sweeping our globe. You know, some people are saying that it's not the virus that is the virus, that's not coronavirus, but that actually the fear consciousness is the virus. And indeed, it's very damaging to our immune systems and to our nervous systems to live in a constant state of anxiety and fear. And it's not just fear of getting the virus. It's fear of what am I going to do? I'm in lockdown. And what's going to happen to my job? Am I going to have a job when this is all over, if it's ever all over? And how am I going to get food into the house? And the supermarkets aren't, don't have enough toilet paper, enough tinned goods. And it seems that all of our fears of the unknown, of what's going to happen next, are here in our face. And the truth of the matter is, we never know what's going to happen from moment to moment. But because we have a set routine in our lives and we have a set number of things that we think are set in place, it gives us a false sense of security, things that we can so-called count on. And so I wanted to address this fear consciousness that all of us have been under experiencing, even if you're feeling at peace inside yourself and resolved to being either in lockdown or quarantine, and you're at peace with that, the, the anxiety's in the air, it's everywhere you go. And I had a, a huge experience of this that came out of nowhere, where I would say not even just fear consciousness coming up, but almost like a panic attack. And I know most of you that know me know that I first had the tumor and in healing from the tumor, the journey, the method that I now teach and have been teaching for the last 26 years, that that was born from healing from that tumor in only six and a half weeks time. Now, the year after that, unexpectedly, and of course, all these kinds of world events, or acts of God, if you want to call them, they come out of nowhere. You know, and I was at that point, I, I'm a New Yorker, but I'd moved from New York to a little tiny beach shack on the beach in California, in Malibu, California. And ours, I don't know the reason why it happened, but ours was the sole and only home that got burned down on the beach, that we had those big, huge mega fires that we uh, additionally had now this year and this past year. And the mega fires somehow jumped over the Pacific Coast Highway. And the log that got carried by the 70 mile an hour winds landed on our roof in our wooden beach place, just it burned to the ground like an inferno. And at that time, we lost everything. Our cars exploded, our home burned down, all our furniture, and it was quite a cataclysmic loss of what I believed to be my life at that point. Well, somehow we cobbled our life back together and through the grace of people offering help from all directions, we cobbled our life back together and moved to a, a, a little two bedroom apartment south of all the disaster and tried to start up our lives again and, you know, put it back together again. And so it's a year after that. And I come home from being on a seminar tour and my husband shares with me that even though we've been together for 20 years at this point, uh, that he is deeply in love with another woman much, much younger than myself and that he's already spoken to her about marriage. This came out of nowhere and hit me like a Mack truck. And I had considered him to be the great love of my life at that point. And of course, yet another thing that coming from the unknown, just out of nowhere. And so the next year was spent in really basically trying to cobble a life together on my own, by myself. And we'd gone to a, um, uh, not even a, um, a lawyer, we'd just gone to an arbitrator who could 
arbitrary, just an agreement that we had. And even though by that time we had been together for 21 years, that uh, we'd agreed not to, um, not to cut everything in half, but instead that he would give me a modest uh, spousal support check for two years so that I could get myself back on my own two feet. Because at that time, much of my uh, you know, vocation was in serving Tony Robbins and, and their seminars, serving my husband in his career, and only a small part of my income was actually in giving uh, private therapy in my private practice. And so I needed a couple of years, you know, and I was then 42 years old and needing to start life anew, you know. And uh, so anyway, I, I, uh, I'd somehow managed, and a year had gone by and the divorce had come through. And in all this time, you know, a, a life-threatening tumor, our house burning down, loss of the marriage, loss of my job at that point, loss of everything that I considered to be my life, I couldn't say that I had overt fear running my game. Of course there was devastation. Of course there was loss. Of course there was heartbreak. But fear was not the consciousness that was coming up through me. And I can remember so clearly, as if it was yesterday, I was there in that small two-bedroom apartment there, south of all the devastation, and I was vacuuming the carpet in my, uh, in my living room. And out of nowhere, whoom, like huge fear came rising up. And I didn't know this, but I had fear of feeling Fear. I had fear of feeling the emotion, fear. And so I did what any of us would do, you know, when a strong, you know, fear just comes through the body, is I flew into action. I started, you know, vacuuming and cleaning and listing more clients, going to movies with friends, watching, you know, and reading more and watching more Netflix or whatever, and just anything to avoid feeling this fear. And it was about a, a, a week later, and once again, I was vacuuming the carpet, so doing some inane task. And again, vroom, up comes this fear. I mean, almost like panic out of nowhere. And again, I'm just throwing myself into more and more action, more activity. And I'm on the run. I'm on the run from fear. The third time this happened, I was standing in front of my couch <laughs> vacuuming and I looked down at the carpet and I thought, I vacuumed that carpet yesterday and I haven't even set, sat on this couch. This carpet's been vacuumed within an inch of its life, you know? And I just finally said, Brandon, what are you running from facing here? And I sat down and I closed my eyes and I asked, Brandon, what are you running from? What are you afraid of? And a picture of my spousal support check arose my awareness and the fear that it wasn't coming in and it was due in a few days time. And I'd already had one or two of them come in, but they just whew, this fear that the spousal support check wasn't coming in. And I thought, surely after all I've been through, a life-threatening tumor, a house burning down, a, a loss of a marriage, a loss of my job, a, a loss of everything, I'm afraid because there's a spousal support check that's not coming in. And I thought, surely that can't be the real fear. That must be some sort of surface manifestation. And so I sat down and I, I took a piece of paper and I thought, I'm going to get to the bottom of this fear. And I wrote at the top of the piece of paper, okay, what's the worst that could happen? And 
I closed my eyes. I thought, okay, what's the worst that could happen? Let's say that that spousal support check doesn't come in. What's the worst that could happen? And I made a, a picture and it was a picture of uh, after about two months, I'd run out of funds and that my landlord, who I was very close to, was going to kick me out of that apartment. And as I saw this picture of my landlord kicking me out, because that's exactly what would happen, not because he wanted to, but because I couldn't pay the rent anymore. And I asked myself, well, how does that make me feel? And there was just this overwhelming fear, fear of the unknown and also shame that a landlord who I'm close to, who cares about me and who I care about, would be compelled to throw me out at the age of 42 years old because I couldn't pay my rent. And I said, okay, if that happened, what's the worst that could happen? And I made a picture of, well, I'd have to go stay with someone. I made a picture originally of going to stay with my mother and immediately I crossed that out as there's no way I was gonna become at the age of 42 years old a parasite to my mother. And so I made a picture of going to go stay with my closest, dearest friend. And we have a saying in the United States that you wear out your welcome. And I knew that my friend would welcome me in for a couple of weeks, but there would come a point where she too would feel in a kind way, but to, you know, kind of push me out of the house. And when I saw that picture and I said, well, how does that make me feel? Just this feeling of devastation and heartbreak and humiliation that my friend would throw me out of her house after a couple of weeks time. And I said, well, if that happened, what's the worst that could happen? I wanted to scrape the barrel, the bottom of the barrel, get to what is the real core fear here. And I said, if that happened, I got thrown out of my friend's house and there was no place else to go. Then what would happen? And I, made a picture of myself on the streets of New York, my hometown. And I'm sitting there with a cup as a beggar. All my education, all my certification, my advanced degrees, all the diplomas, all my life experience and background. And I would end up as a beggar on the streets of New York. And I asked, how does that make me feel? And what's really here? And the core fear was that intrinsically, I believed I did not have what it takes to survive. That it didn't matter how much education I had, how much diploma, how many diplomas I had, how many advanced degrees and certifications, how much life experience, that at rock bottom, I had a core belief, a core fear, that intrinsically, no matter what, I did not have what it takes to survive. And when I surrendered to that feeling, this fear of not having what it takes to survive, I said, okay, well, what if it's true? You don't have what it takes to survive. And I made a picture and of course, well, if I don't have what it takes to survive, the body would die. And I kind of saw in my mind's eye, my physical form dissolving. It started to just fall away, dissolve away. And I fell into an infinite presence sort of a, a nothingness, a presence of stillness, of peace that was pervading all of existence. And there was this direct recognition that even if the body died, 
this that I am, that is part of the fabric of all of existence, the universe, does not die. Spontaneously, unexpectedly, I'd fallen into my own soul, into this vast, boundless presence of peace, of awareness, of love. And there was the realization that this that I am is eternal. And I asked, well, who am I? Who am I? If I'm not the body, who am I? And as I began to ask that question, I kept opening deeper into this boundless presence which I didn't have a name for, but it had a, a sense of light, of peace, of stillness, of rightness, of at-homeness. And I just kept asking and opening in this that I am. And I opened my eyes and I thought, okay, I now know what my deepest fear was. My deepest fear was that I did not have what it takes to survive. That I didn't have intrinsically the wherewithal to survive. And I circled that fear and I said to myself, okay, let's say I do a journey process and I really finish with that fear, which is what the journey process helps you do. I then asked myself, and I turned the page over, what's the best that could happen? Let's say I face down and clear and finish with that fear that I do not have what it takes to survive. What's the best that could happen? And I just started letting it free flow, like it was just downloading, you know, just automatic writing. Well, the best that could happen, I need to realize that that check isn't coming in. And in fact, it never came in again. And that I need to get real and get myself down to the meditation center that's there in Santa Monica and see if I can find a roommate who could help me cut the bills in half so they can stay in one bedroom, I'll stay in another. And that would immediately cut the bills in half. And I asked, well, if I did that, if that happened, then what would happen? Well, the best that could happen is not only do I cut my bills in half, is that would buy me the time I need to finally find the courage to call up my friends in the seminar business, which I've been in my, virtually my whole adult life, and let them know I had this amazing work called The Journey that people could undergo to to really get to the root cause of what was causing any of their emotional issues and finish at the deepest level, to come home to the peace inside and to also clear whatever cell memories are stored in the body. And that if I could buy myself some time, I would call up my friends and I would offer to them, listen as, and share with them this amazing work that had given birth to it self through me as a result of healing from that tumor. And I thought, okay, if I did that, called my friends and offered to give a journey seminar in their houses and split the money with them, then what would happen? What's the best that could happen? Well, the best that could happen is that a lot of people experience not only cellular healing, but they, they awaken and come home to the truth of who they really are, to the love inside of themselves, to the peace that is their own soul. And I thought, wow, well, if that happened, then what would happen? Well, more and more seminars would happen as people were healing physically, emotionally, mentally. And if that happened, then what would happen? What's the best that could happen? Well, then books would start getting written and, and hundreds of thousands of people would start getting the work. And if that, that would that happen, then what would happen? Well, there'd be television shows and radio shows and there'd be, there'd be, uh, it'd become a worldwide phenomenon where people could have access to this extraordinary, profoundly liberating work and healing work. If that happened, then 
Then what would happen? Well, the best that could happen, it would end up getting into the homes and hearts of people around the world in all different countries and all different languages, and that people would have the tools they need to liberate their lives, to free their lives. And that all of us would become part of a wave of awakening and healing sweeping our globe. And I looked at the list of all the best that could happen. And I said, well, if that were to happen, all the best that could happen, if that were to happen, does that give me the leverage I need to face down and clear my worst, deepest fear? You bet it did. And that day, I did a journey process, which you can get from the journey book on, online, uh, you know, from Amazon. You can, uh, if you already have the book, you can then use that right? You can use the book from the, uh, the process from the back of the book. But in any case, I did a journey process and I swept it clean. And guess what? Everything on that list of the best that could happen ended up happening. The next day I found a roommate at that meditation center. It caused me to split my bills in half, which bought me the time. I started calling friends and invent it first started as a few seminars happening in people's homes, but very quickly it started developing and growing. And I ended up then giving big seminars all over Europe, America, Australia, the Middle East. And then a book was written and and it became an international bestseller. Over a million copies already have been sold. And then after that, I mean, we actually have six books in our family of books that we have. And, and I ended up now working in 39 countries and it's translated into 24 languages. And I've been in over, I don't know, 200 television shows and uh, over 400 newspapers and magazine articles and uh, I mean on and on everything that was on that list actually ended up manifesting because I found the courage to face down my worst fear and get to the real root what's driving that fear which in my case was fear that I didn't have what it takes to survive. And in opening and surrendering wholly to that fear, letting it have me, falling into my own self, into the soul. So if you feel that this is speaking to you and you've got a half an hour of time right now, I'd like to suggest that you get a piece of paper and on one part of the paper, you write down what's the worst that could happen. It's going to drive up your fears and you'll make a picture. Draw a line down the middle of the page. How does that make me feel? And if that happened, then what's the worst that could happen? And let the picture, how it makes you feel, the picture, how it makes you feel, the picture, how it makes you feel, until you scrape the bottom of the barrel, which for most of us is the fear of non-existence. Non-existence of a body, non-existence of the mind, non-existence of our identity that we identify ourselves as. And if you open wholly and surrender into that deepest, darkest fear, you will find yourself free falling and dissolving and opening into your own soul, into this vast boundless presence of love, of life, of peace. And then you can begin asking, well, who am I? And it will carry you deeper into your soul. Then you turn the page over. And at the top of the page, you write, if I face and clear my worst fear, what is the best that can happen? And you write enthusiastically, if I've cleared that worst fear, what's the best that could happen? And you start writing, just writing, writing, writing with a lot of enthusiasm. And when you're done with that, you look and drink in the best that could happen. 
and look at that list of that worst fear, that circled worst fear, and ask, does this list of the best that can happen give me the courage I need to do a journey process and get to that worst fear? And if it does, then I recommend, I think there's an audio version of me online, there's there's a, the book online. You can get together with a friend if you've got uh, the scripts and just process with each other and finish with it. All the journey is born from that one day that I found the courage to face down and clear my worst fear. And so you've got nothing to lose but a bunch of baggage. And you've got everything to gain by finally finishing this game of running from your fear and instead turn in and offer yourself to the tiger's mouth of fear. I promise you the liberation you will feel the recognition of who you really are as worth it all. And it's from that place of stillness, of peace, that a wordless conscious action can birth itself where you feel a guidedness, not from the, the craziness of our monkey minds, but a guidedness from the heart from this that is your own infinite awareness. And when you're pulled into action by that stillness, by that peace, you'll find that all the doors will open up for you to have conscious actions, even during this time of craziness in our world. And you can then become a living transmission of the stillness, helping bring your family home to the stillness, your friends home to this, trading processes on Skype, online, and giving yourself the gift of coasting through this time of living in the unknown. We're always living in the unknown is the truth of it. From a place of an underlying peace. And so I pray you'll use this as an invitation to discover the truth of who you are, the love, the peace that is your own essence. And that peace will guide you and help you navigate through the storm that we're all living in right now. And so a heartfelt namaste.